Alicia Martin Cochran was born on August 10, 1965. She grew up in Alabama, was a good student and cheerleader at Pell City High School, and dreamed of becoming an airline stewardess. At the age of 26, she lived on Martin Street in Pell City, Alabama, had three children, and was separated from her husband, Travis. She was described as very kind, would do anything for anyone, and absolutely adored her children. Unfortunately, the truth about him would slowly come out after she and Travis married. They had a son together, and he became so controlling that she often had to sneak to even visit her family. She also learned that he and his family were allegedly heavy drug dealers and were very feared in their community. Felicia would eventually get the courage to up and leave him. She would move back in with her mother, and that's when Travis began stalking and harassing her. On more than one occasion, he followed her and tried to run her off the road by bumping into her car. During one of those incidents, all three of her children were in the car. Once, he put something in her car that destroyed her motor, forcing her to buy a new one. One day, Felicia's mother, Mary, noticed something strange sticking out from under the house that she initially thought was a snake. However, it was a black cord leading to a handmade phone-tapping device. Travis had been sneaking under the house each night to switch out tapes from the recording device he had attached to their landline. People close to her encouraged her to press charges, but she was afraid to go to the police. Close to 6 p.m. on July 11, 1992, she asked her 10-year-old daughter, Brandy, if she wanted to go with her to the salon, but she declined. Although it may have saved her life, it's a decision she will regret forever. Her mother went alone to the beauty parlor in Pell City for a hair appointment. Afterward, those inside noticed Felicia arguing with someone in the parking lot. It was bad enough that they called the police. But by the time the police arrived, Felicia was gone. Twelve hours later, her gray 1987 Nissan Sentra was discovered abandoned and burned on Turner's Mill Road, an isolated road near the Talladega Speedway in Talladega County, Alabama. However, there was no sign of Felicia, and she has never been seen since. Her children have grown up without their loving mother, but all three persevered and are now busy career professionals. Felicia's only son, Quadarius, later became a police officer in Jacksonville, Alabama. Being the youngest child, he never got to instill memories of his mother that were taken from him. Her eldest daughter, Brandy, received a Master of Public Administration in Emergency Management in 2008 from Jacksonville State University. She had received her bachelor's degree from Talladega College and now works for the Social Security Administration along with her younger sister, Tanya. They have used their experiences to help give back to the community by working with the Black and Missing Organization, which helps families and police shed light on missing people of color. There is currently a $10,000 reward for information leading to the resolution of the case. Her family wants her remains found so they can lay her to rest properly, but as of October 2022, she has never been found and this case remains unsolved. At the age of 48, Roger Lloyd Taylor was a father of four living in Sullivan, Alabama. He had numerous severe health conditions as a result of drug use and had limited mobility following a stroke, COPD, and heart disease. As his health declined, his behavior began to change and his temper worsened. On March 10, 2019, Roger's wife reported that he had become very angry, resulting in them both leaving the home. When Roger left, he headed to visit his daughter. But on his way, he would get lost and get his vehicle stuck in the mud. He had been in communication with his daughter over the phone and then sent her a text around 9.35 p.m. After this, he would never arrive and was never seen alive again. About two days later, his car was discovered in the Gatman area of Monroe County, 
off Blair Cemetery Road in Mississippi, but there was no sign of Roger. Then, on August 30th, 2022, three years later, a Mississippi minister by the name of James Eric Crisp walked into Monroe County Sheriff's Office and confessed to his friend, Sheriff Crook, that he had killed Roger. He said the two had a physical altercation before he killed Roger and disposed of his body near Blair Cemetery Road, the same area his car was found. He was then arrested and charged with manslaughter. Crisp, a longtime drug user who was raised by chronic drug users, said he came under heavy conviction while ministering at the Kill Michael Recovery Center. He said his faith became strong and he felt he needed to confess to the crime. Chris then attempted to help authorities recover Roger's remains, but they were unsuccessful and the exact location could never be determined. The murder occurred before Chris had become a minister. He had been arrested for drug trafficking, and as part of his bond for his drug trafficking offense, he began living in a Christian discipleship program called God's House of Hope, where he became a teacher and a preacher and subsequently regained custody of his two kids. It turns out that the drug charge came about two months after the murder. He is a former resident of the Gatman area of Monroe County, the place where he says he hid the remains. Roger's daughter, Brianne, visited Chris in jail after his arrest to question him about murdering her father. She asked him if he was hiding behind his faith, to which he strangely responded, Yes, amen. Brianne, along with many others in the community, believes the only reason he confessed is that one of his children threatened to turn him in. He has prior felony charges for drug possession and trafficking, but claims to be a changed man. However, Brienne and others aren't buying it and recall Crisp assisting her family in search of her father, knowing what he had done the whole time. Brienne said her father and Crisp met each other through her as her boyfriend and Crisp were best friends at the time. She had assisted Crisp in the past when he needed help with money and transportation and a place to live. A search was done again in 2020 in the area near Blair Cemetery Road to locate Roger's remains, but once again was unsuccessful. They might be unable to find it due to the flood water shifting the landscape over the last three years. It's unclear when or if searches for Roger's body will continue at this point. Daniel Kenneth Oberg, who went by Danny, was born on February 8, 1990, to parents Kenneth and Sherry. At the age of 28, he lived with his father in Lynn County, Oregon. Danny was described as a free spirit who always had a positive attitude. He was known to camp in the Courtsville Recreation Corridor in Lynn County and enjoyed playing online video games. He had a knack for building and fixing computers and cell phones and would make money on the side selling repaired devices. On the morning of April 23, 2017, he left home to spend the day with his two friends, Sean and Caleb, and his two beloved dogs that he took with him everywhere. He told his father he had some things to do and had to take his friends home and would be back that afternoon. Danny was seen on surveillance video around lunchtime at the local Safeway in Sweet Home, Oregon, with one of his friends purchasing some various items. Outside in Danny's car were his two dogs, Misa and Coda, along with his other friend. After this sighting, Danny was never seen again and never returned home. Two days later, his father reported him missing as it was very unusual for him not to respond to text or calls and not to return home. Investigators were able to track his cell phone pings and the last ping was in Sweet Home, the same town he lived in. Hours later, his car was found abandoned near mile marker 13 on a hillside off Marcola Road, that area is known for having a dense forest, making it very difficult to search in. But his phone never pinged in that area, and it's suspected that Danny was not the person to abandon the car. The officer called Danny's father to come to get the car and take it home, or else it would be impounded. 
The car was never taken in for evidence and instead released to his father, who said it looked like it had been ransacked with numerous items strewn about and potato chips on the floor. A receipt from Safeway was found inside, leading them to review the video surveillance from that day. Danny usually kept the car clean because it was actually his grandmother's car that he often used and he would have never abandoned it. Meanwhile, his friend Sean Larson was also missing and his other friend Caleb was allegedly found at his stepmother's house and many said it seemed as if he was hiding out. Sean later resurfaced several days later and both he and Caleb initially claimed that Danny dropped them off before he went missing. Then, rumors began circulating that a drug debt led to Danny's disappearance, but there has been no evidence to support this. Danny was not a heavy drug user and was actually very health conscious, although he had used drugs in the past. It's well known, however, that he lives in an area with a lot of meth activity and he hung out with people that were drug users. Either way, the investigators were able to account for the time that Sean was MIA. Rumors began circulating that Danny had overdosed at a party and was buried in a shallow grave. The most telling tale was that Danny had recently received a tax income check and was killed for the money. Some speculate that his friends were either involved or were witnesses to his alleged murder and are afraid they would be murdered if they ever came forward. Less than two weeks after Danny was last seen at the Safeway, both dogs were found by a farmer who could only catch Coda, the puppy. But Misa was hard to catch, and it would be another 11 days before Misa was caught near mile marker 12, appearing much thinner. Nevertheless, everyone who knows Danny says he would have never abandoned his dogs and treated them like they were his kids. In December, Lane County Sheriff's Search and Rescue teamed up with Lynn County Sheriff's Office Search and Rescue to cover a section of private timber lands searching for clues. On December 16, 2017, a group of 29 search and rescue volunteers and staff, including ground searchers and canine teams, combed the area. Unfortunately, by the end of the weekend, no new clues had been found indicating Danny's whereabouts. Suspiciously, Sean and Caleb have allegedly never helped search for their friend. His parents remain dedicated to finding answers and believe that someone knows what happened to their son, but as of October 2022, he has never been found and this case remains unsolved. There's very little information in this case, but I still wanted to include it in the video. At the age of 22, Jonathan Todd Williams was a father to a one-year-old son and was employed at Walmart. He lived at the Hope Village Mobile Home Park on South Adams Street in the small town of Carthage, Texas, and was described as quiet, reserved, and a homebody who could always be found at work or home. At about 11 p.m. on March 31, 2015, someone knocked on his door. As Jonathan opened the door, someone immediately opened fire. His father heard the shots and ran to the living room, but the killer or killers were already gone. Jonathan would not survive the gunshots and would die in his father's arms. When authorities arrived, Jonathan was deceased on the couch, still wearing his Walmart jacket. His mother, Alma Williams, said she knows that someone in their small community knows who killed her son, and she hopes they will do the right thing and come forward. Carthage police have polygraphed at least one suspect and sent off forensic evidence to be tested. However, without any solid leads, the police are relying on citizens for information to move forward. As of October 2022, no one has ever been arrested in the murder of Jonathan Todd Williams, and this case remains unsolved. At the age of three, Mayana Smith lived on Allenhurst Road in Amherst, New York. Mayana lived with her mother, 23-year-old Ruhaya Shropshire, her mother's boyfriend, 26-year-old Lamari Daniels, who had a history of domestic violence and drug abuse, 
and Rahaya's infant daughter. Mayana had been sexually and physically abused by those responsible for her, and CPS had allegedly been notified on four separate occasions. However, CPS denied having any reports or knowledge of abuse and claimed to be unaware of the situation. On January 17, 2014, a neighbor heard a man yelling and cursing inside Shropshire and Daniel's apartment, followed by a little girl screaming. Police were called, and upon entering the apartment, little Mayana was found deceased on the floor next to an air mattress. Daniels claimed he had no idea what happened to her, and Shropshire wasn't saying much either and looked very intimidated by Daniels. Due to Mayana's death and apparent neglect from Shropshire and Daniels, the other infant in the home was placed into foster care. A year and a half after Mayana's death, the Buffalo News would request her death reports. According to the death reports, Mayana had been dealing with physical abuse for a while. Shockingly, though, no arrests were ever made and the couple became uncooperative with investigators. Shropshire was initially cooperative, but once she and Daniel separated, she stopped communicating with them. She also became pregnant with her third child. Still, eight years later, police say there still isn't enough evidence to arrest Daniels, who remains in Buffalo, New York, or anyone for that matter, and as of October 2022, this case remains unsolved. Cheryl Rowe was born in 1966 and was the youngest of five with four older brothers. She grew up in the Brown Dell Crescent subdivision near Taylor Mills Drive and Bayview Avenue in Richmond Hill, Ontario, Canada. Following school, Cheryl worked as a waitress in numerous restaurants, including Pop's Tavern, the Richmond Inn, Galaxy, and the Three Coins Open Kitchen at Yonge and Center Streets. At the age of 48, Cheryl lived in Richmond Hill, had a small close-knit group of friends, and had two children, Shane and Christina. Her father was receiving his first cancer treatment at Sunnybrook Hospital, and her mother had died in an elevator on her way to see him. Once her parents passed away, many of her family members became estranged and grew apart because they had been the glue that kept everything together. This saddened Cheryl, who was very close to her mother. Cheryl would become very lonely after her mother's passing and would eventually turn to drugs to cope. The drugs would cause her mental health problems, and the more she took the drugs, the worse her mental health got. Despite that, family always remained at the top of her priority list, and she desired to continue having the same family holiday gatherings and get-togethers. On December 21, 2011, she spent the day with her daughter, Christina Clark, Christmas shopping at Walmart. Afterward, they parted ways, but then Christina called her mother to ask if she could meet her on a path near her uncle's house with some clothes. Christina needed the clothes because she was planning to spend the night at a friend's house in the area, and her mother agreed to meet at 11 p.m. However, Cheryl would not leave her house until midnight because her ride was an hour late. Her family says they saw Cheryl leaving with a bag in hand at around midnight after the car picked her up. Before meeting Christina, Cheryl planned to drop by her ex-boyfriend's home at 34 Rathfon Crescent in Richmond Hill near Yonge and Carville Streets. This would be the last time she was ever seen and would never make it to meet Christina. A few days later, when Cheryl didn't show up on Christmas morning, Christina reported her missing as she knew her mother wouldn't miss Christmas with her family for the world. With the search warrant, investigators excavated the grounds surrounding her ex-boyfriend's home. The York Regional Police have executed extensive searches in the Mill Pond and Greenbelt areas of Richmond Hill, but no signs of Cheryl's remains were found. Her family has set up a Facebook group that is updated often, and many have shared memories and photos on the page. Her brother Mitchell believes the only way the case will be solved is if one individual, who he believes knows what occurred that night, finally talks to the police. The York police have also come to the same conclusion and agree with Mitchell. 
Detective Sergeant Bob Papineau stated that a group of people in Cheryl's close-knit circle most likely have information about her disappearance. Her daughter said she believes that at least two or three people know the truth. Her family just wants to recover her remains to lay her to rest, but as of October 2022, she has never been found and this case remains unsolved.